Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I will start our meeting today. We have invited Professor Josef Stieglitz. Welcome in the European Parliament. And uh, Professor uh, Ocampo, former minister from Columbi Columbia and now professor in Columbia, on Columbia <laughs> University. <laughs> Good. Uh, today I am very pleased to welcome Professor Josef Stieglitz, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics, here with us, and I thank you for your av availability. We have invited you as former expert of the Panamian Inquiry Committee on the Panama Papers, and we are very happy to have the occasion for an exchange of views on our, your experience with that uh, Inquiry Committee. We have sent you a list of questions in advance of this meeting. And we are very honored that you took time during the weekend to send your replies This have been circulated to the members of the committee. And uh, uh, after your introduction, <coughs> if it possible, 10 minutes, uh, I will open the floor to question and answers with Panama members. We have 14 uh, languages available today, uh, and uh, questions will be asked in slots of normally five minutes. I think we need to reduce it to three <coughs> minutes today. A question of minimum one minute uh, with the remaining time devoted to the answer. Professor Stieglitz, the floor is yours. Please. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to address you. Uh, uh, I think the subject uh, of your uh, committee is uh, extraordinarily important uh, because the uh, secrecy havens that, to which the Panama Papers drew attention uh, have a very pernicious uh, effect on our uh, global uh, society, not only our global economy, but our broader global society. Uh, these are centers through which there is tax avoidance, tax evasion, but also money laundering that supports corruption, uh, that supports uh, a whole range of nefarious activities. One of the things that Panama Papers did was to bring home the, the, the magnitude of the kinds of nefarious activities that were going on. Uh, of course, we all knew that uh, these uh, secrecy havens were up to no good. Uh, we all knew that there was a lots of uh, bad activities that were going on uh, within these secrecy havens. But in a very forceful way, the Panama Papers uh, uh, brought uh, to light, uh, brought home very forcefully what was going on. I should emphasize that 80% uh, of the activities going on described in the Panama Papers did not go on in Panama, uh, which highlights that this is a global problem. Uh, the name Panama Papers came partly because the wonderful alliteration in English of Panama Papers, uh, like Lux Leaks. Uh, and uh, if you want an idea to stick, uh, something like Lux Leaks and Panama Papers uh, really helps it stick in your mind. Um, but it was also because at the center of uh, the Panama Papers was a Panamanian law firm that was engaged in uh, 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 all the activities. It was a leak, uh, a, a, a treasure trove of, of uh, uh, do, uh, documents that were re released from one law firm. 
And remember, this is only one of uh, at least four major law firms. In fact, in Panama, it is viewed as one of the smaller of the four law firms. And uh, so as you can imagine, this is one of the smaller law firms. Uh, we don't know what was going on in the other law firms. You can imagine the magnitude of what is going on uh, uh, in, in uh, these secrecy uh, havens. Well, uh, just uh, for those who hadn't had a ch time to look at my written answers very briefly, uh, after the Panama Papers uh, uh, came out, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Panama felt that its reputation had suffered some damage, uh, deservedly so. And uh, particularly in the context of Noriega and drugs, uh, it felt very much that it had to uh, restore its reputation. And uh, I had hoped that it was more interested in more than just restoring its reputation, but actually changing its business model. And they sent their vice president to New York, to Columbia, to persuade me to join a commission with Mark Pyth, who is a, uh, a very uh, a, a Swiss <coughs> lawyer who has been involved in anti-corruption uh, uh, campaigns uh, for 25 years with the OECD. Uh, he had agreed to join, and uh, one of the reasons that I uh, agreed to join was I thought it would provide a model of what could be done. Here was a, a country that was willing to reform and uh, would provide a role model for other countries. And uh, to be frank, among the countries that I wanted it to be a role model for was the United States, uh, because the United States uh, has a lot of secrecy that goes on in Delaware, Nevada, a, a, a large number of states. Uh, and uh, so my hope was that by studying one small country, one could get a template that would be useful from a global perspective. Well, unfortunately, uh, at the very beginning of our deliberations, we said, uh, uh, we told the Panamanian government that we had needed reassurances that our report would be transparent, uh, would be made public uh, after a suitable time for the government to react. And uh, we waited weeks and weeks and weeks, and the government uh, did not provide these reassurances, and eventually we were told that we would not get such reassurances, and so at that point we felt we had to resign. <coughs> but we felt that we had done enough work and, and were sufficiently committed to those issues that we thought it would be useful to write a report that would at least uh, summarize some of our understandings of what we had gleaned and what we had already prepared uh, 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 on the subject. So that's, uh, the, that was the origin of our report, Overcoming uh, the Shadow Economy, that uh, we were just uh, releasing. And let me just uh, describe very briefly a, a, a few of the central ideas. Um, the first is that, that this kind of secrecy is part of the darker side of globalization, uh, that uh, uh, the hiding of money, uh, whether it uh, originates from uh, money laundering or tax evasion, uh, uh, undermines uh, the functioning of the global society. And uh, we wrote the report uh, before the political events in, in the United States of last week but we were very convinced that if we could not <coughs> convince our citizens that we could temper globalization, there would be an anti-globalization uh, reaction. And so our view is that anybody who uh, thinks that, that uh, it, globalization is a good thing has to be willing to address the darker side of globalization, and this is uh, the darker the darker side of, of, of globalization. Uh, one of the things we also emphasize is that 
there needs to be a comprehensive approach to, to, to secrecy. That if there is any uh, place in the world where uh, secrecy remains, then uh, those who are want to use secrecy for their nefarious activities will find those and uh, will will hide their activities in those centers. So there has to be basically a comprehensive global approach with <coughs> essentially zero tolerance for uh, for secrecy. And that means, of course, that secrecy has to be attacked globally. Um, but having said that it has to be attacked globally, uh, I believe that Europe alone uh, can have uh, a very significant impact. Uh, the world, uh, you know, some people say, well, you can't uh, deal with it. It's too complex, too difficult. But in fact, in when we attacked uh, secrecy in the context of the war on terrorism, uh, we were able to uh, root it out. Uh, we were able to detect where the money was flowing for terrorism. But we chose not to do that for money laundering and for uh, all these other activities. It reminds me of a, a, a talk I gave um, uh, at one of the, uh, at one time I got, every once in a while I got invited to one of these uh, secrecy havens uh, to give a lecture. And I gave a lecture uh, and told them how, uh, 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 how corrosive what they were doing was to the global economy. I, I didn't understand why they had invited me. I thought maybe it was a form of penance that they felt better having listened to a lecture by me how terrible they were, that it was a cleansing experience for them and they could then go ahead and uh, once again go ahead and do what they did, uh, wanted. But uh, at the end of my talk, um, uh, one of the <coughs> bankers uh, came up to me and said, you don't understand uh, our business model. We don't do the things uh, that you said. We don't do uh, narco uh, money. We don't do uh, uh, bribery, corruption. Uh, we only do money laundering. We only do tax evasion. <laughs> and, and, um, no trucks. And I, I, I said, well, how do you know that? And I was curious, and he said, well, because we asked them. <laughs> so anyway, there's an important lesson out of this. Uh, I, I think it has to be uh, attacked uh, comprehensively, and I do think that Europe alone can make a very big difference. Um, one of the uh, things that we emphasize in our report, or note in our report, is it is not just offshore centers that are engaged in uh, these kinds of activities. It's onshore. Onshore both in the United States and in Europe. And therefore, it's very important for both the U.S. and Europe to deal with the problem. Belatedly, in the response to the Panama Papers, the U.S. government has begun to do some things. Uh, there has been a response uh, from the U.S. Treasury in response to the Panama Papers. Uh, and they've done, you know, uh, some things about beneficial ownership, which I'll come to uh, in a second. Uh, but at least there's been some response already. Uh, I am not hopeful, I should share with you, that this will continue under our new administration because he is a tax evader, if not avoider. Uh, so uh, when you're... Uh, 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 when your president is uh, uh, evader or avoider uh, in chief, uh, it's hard to have uh, uh, confidence uh, in the uh, uh, in in where uh, we are going to go. But that's why it is even more important for Europe to take up the leadership on this issue. Otherwise, it will uh, it, it it really risks uh, disappearing. Uh, the um, other, uh, another thing that we emphasize in our report is that it goes beyond 
financial markets. A lot of attention has been focused on banks. Uh, banks have played a very bad role in many of these activities, and uh, some of them have been fined significant amounts. Uh, but the banks have under, been under sufficient scrutiny that, for the most part, uh, they've reformed. I don't want to say uh, uh, with enthusiasm, but they've, they've, uh, they, they've been forced to respond. But there is a whole set of other, uh, there's a whole set of, oh, a whole industry that uh, services secrecy, and in particular the lawyers. Uh, Monseca, uh, the, the law firm who's, from whom the, the treasure trove of information came is an example. And uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, propose very strong measures to deal uh, in our report with these uh, law firms. Um, one of the things that we also emphasize, in many cases countries will sign agreements and that they will be open, transparent, uh, they will have automatic exchange of tax information, they will do other things. Uh, and then, having signed the agreements, everybody can go home happy. Except you shouldn't go home happy, because uh, enforcement is really key. And the, the countries know that you can sign an agreement and then not enforce it, and nothing will happen. And in many of these countries, as you can imagine, the judiciary is not exactly um, uh, likely to enforce uh, strongly these kinds of uh, agreements. So it will be international enforcement that will be required. So it's not just what people agree to do. It's going to require heavy focus on enforcement. There are a lot of details in, in our report of what both the consequences, the principles uh, that underlie uh, an attack on the shadow economy. Um, there's one particular uh, thing that I think, if I if were to single out a, a, a particular thing that, that, we're, we're, we, we, that would make a difference, and that is the uh, uh, issue of um, beneficial ownership of corporations. Uh, one of the things that uh, those engaged in these nefarious activities have learned is that if you set up a chain of corporations and corporation, secret corporation A owns secret corporation B owns secret corporation C who owns D, then uh, no one can go through the trouble of tracing. And so it costs them very little to create this complex web, and it uh, makes it uh, very difficult for enforcement agencies to penetrate this uh, web. So we argue that there ought to be searchable, public, publicly searchable uh, registries of beneficial owners, that's the real people, not the fake corporation, but the real people who eventually own it. There are details in defining, uh, uh, in defining it, but this to me is, is absolutely critical. And, and the reason it has to be searchable is that it has to be possible for not only law enforcement agencies, but the media to find out who is engaged in doing uh, uh, what activities. Um, it is not just illicit activities, though, that use this complex web of corporations. Many of our large multinational enterprises have hundreds of subsidiaries. And you ask, what do they need hundreds of subsidiaries? What are they doing? And, of course, the suspicion is very clear. They are trying to avoid paying their uh, taxes. Uh, they are trying to protect themselves, for instance, against limited liability, uh, against uh, if they engage in bad b behavior and, and they get sued. So whatever it is, uh, it's not above the board. 
So it is, we have to remember it's not only illicit activity that, that is making use of these complex webs, but even some respectable corporations uh, in the United States and Europe. And so that's why uh, the activities of your committee are so important, uh, particularly in the context of what is happening politically in the United States. Uh, it is particularly important that Europe take uh, up uh, the responsibility of exposing uh, and making sure that these uh, secrecy havens are not uh, able to continue playing the role of undermining uh, global society in the way that they have. Thank you very much, Professor Stieglitz, for this free and open introduction. Uh, I look to my watch, uh, and I now would like to open the floor for the debate with the members of the PANA Committee. I will start with our uh, two co-rapporteurs, uh, Jeppe Kofort and Peter Jecek. Jeppe, please. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Joe, for this uh, excellent presentation. I have uh, three very concrete questions. First of all, in your written answer, you say that secrecy has to be attacked globally, onshore, offshore. So what can we do in the short term also on this as the European Union uh, as a global society, and is there an idea to call for a global summit on transparency to end secrecy haven, for example? I mean, we have global summits on climate change and so on. This is, I think, as important. Secondly, in a, in a report adopted by this parliament this summer, we ask for a study to, to set up a global register of all assets, financial assets, that people and companies are holding. Uh, is that a feasible idea, and can we do that, and which institution could provide such kind of assets? And it has to be searchable, as you also said. It's, it's an idea we can follow. And then thirdly, um, you talk about sanctions and consequences for the enablers of, uh, of tax evasion and so on, uh, the law firms, the wealth managers, I have to add, and others. What is your suggestion? What can we do on this? On, on this? I mean, could we remove business licenses, and on what type of sanctions can be implemented immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Stieglitz. Yeah. For the answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the idea of having a global summit is a, a, very, uh, a very good one. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the point that you raised, this is a, a, a serious global problem. Uh, and uh, the work of Frankston Zuckman has, has pointed out what large fraction of global wealth has escaped uh, uh, taxation uh, and reporting. And in some ways I should emphasize uh, the problem is worse in many ways in Europe than it is in the United States for the following reason, on the tax side, not in corruption, but on the tax side. Uh, in the United States we have taxation based on uh, citizenship. So a, an American citizen has to report his income no matter where it occurs, even if it's in the Cayman Islands. And so going to the Cayman Islands, in principle, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, shield him from reporting income. Uh, it, 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 uh, if he sets up a, a, a uh, shell corporation, he can only avoid reporting it if, he, if the American ownership is a minority. And that's where Americans and Europeans interact. If it's a majority European owner, ownership, then the American is helped uh, in secrecy. So there is a, 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 an externality from, from your actions to the United States. But with European, most European countries based on residency and where people uh, earn their income, and so you don't have as much global reach in your tax, and therefore uh, this kind of uh, use of offshore centers particularly is, is, is more problematic uh, in the case of Europe. And therefore it's more important for uh, I think Europe even more than the United States. So in any case, I think a global summit to draw attention to this and to, to, uh, to say this needs to be addressed 
globally would be uh, very useful. It's very useful for another reason. Uh, I've talked to uh, some of the other um, uh, secrecy havens, and at least one of the secrecy havens has said to, uh, to me, we don't like being in this business. Uh, we would like to be better, but what good would it do if we're better and the money just goes somewhere else? So their view is they say they're willing to be better citizens if everybody else is a better citizen. So if you could uh, uh, create in a global summit a new set of global norms, they couldn't use that excuse anymore. Uh, it, there would be a new set of norms, and then you could really go after the countries that are uh, uh, undermining those global norms. So I think a global summit where you've set out a set of principles would, would, uh, would be extraordinarily uh, uh, useful. Um, I think uh, on the second question, I think uh, there is <clears throat> no reason that uh, each individual country can't disclose the beneficial ownership of all corporations listed within those, incorporated in those countries. And that would be one of the norms that uh, you would set up. So uh, Panama, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of corporations. Um, we want to know who is the beneficial owner of these corporations. What are these corporations doing? Uh, why do they exist? Uh, are they making income? If they're not do, engaged in income, why? Do, you know, is it? Is, and and part of the agenda that we talk about is uh, to. Uh, uh, increase, uh, ha have filing requirements to say every year what they have done and make them pay a fee every year, the object of which is that the web of thousands of dead corporations could be cleared out very quickly, and then you can focus on the corporations that actually are, do exist and, are, and figure out what is going on in these corporations. So uh, that side is, is, I think, very feasible. Uh, there, uh, the, the broader sense of there are assets all over the world, and each country would then have to create a registry of all the ownership of assets. And that doesn't exist even in advanced countries today. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, oh, I, I see. And, and, uh, and then the final one is uh, uh, on the sanctions. I think um, one of the things we propose are very strong sanctions against uh, countries uh, and firms that don't comply with what we've uh, described, uh, including uh, in the case of companies losing uh, their business license, the license to operate, in the case of countries, uh, countries that uh, do not comply with the uh, transparency norms uh, should be effectively cut off. That is to say, it should be illegal for uh, banks in the EU to deal, do business with the banks in uh, those jurisdictions that do not comply with international norms. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Peter Jacek. Please, co-rapporteur. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professors, for being with us and for the written information uh, submitted. Well, it, it's been said that, uh, that uh, there is a need for uh, international reinforcement, which that's what is required. Uh, and it seems that, that the, the United Kingdom uh, leaves and Donald Trump comes and there is a city of London, there are the British Virgin Islands, and when I, when I went through the, the U.S. president-elect tax reform, which uh, that, that will make America great again, uh, there is at least an acknowledgement that some companies have been leaving cash overseas as a tax maneuver. And uh, 
Well, by the way, it suggests uh, one time deemed repatriation of corporate cash held overseas at a significantly discounted 10% tax rate. But apart from that, what, what, what do you think uh, how, how it can affect our fight, these changes against the, the tax avoidance, tax evasion, and money laundering? I mean, on the international theme. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Stieglitz. Yeah. So, uh, very broadly, I, I think uh, the issue, the first issue raised of Oh, the onshore tax evasion of tax avoidance uh, money of the City of London, <laughs> British Virgin Island. That's what I referred to uh, before, that both in Europe and in the United States there are jurisdictions which uh, do not comply with what I would say are good norms. And that's uh, where I think uh, the EU as a whole has to take strong actions uh, domestically, that, they, that should not be allowed, and put pressure on the constituent countries. And internationally, in the same way that you, uh, I don't think you should discriminate between Panama and the United States. Uh, I know that's, uh, in practice, uh, real politics may, may make that uh, difficult, but the fact is that, that uh, if there are these uh, secrecy havens within the United States, uh, one should take strong actions against them. Now, as I say, the good news is that the U.S. Treasury did take some actions in response to the Panama paper. Not enough, but at least it was moving in the right direction, which shows how public pressure can help move the dial on these issues. Uh, on the particular issue of uh, the U.S. taxes, uh, tax money uh, overseas, uh, that was a... a um, a, a really flaw in our tax code, which um, I think uh, should have been corrected. We've known about it for a long time, where we said that American corporations making money abroad are not taxed on the profits until they repatriate it to the United States. And that provided them incentives not to invest in the United States. And that was really very poorly designed. It was actually a job destroyer for the United States. And we've recognized that, you know, and it just shows you the influence of international corporations that they uh, uh, were able to uh, get this provision uh, into our tax code, even though it was very bad for job creation in the United States. But the tax holiday that's been proposed was tried once before under President Bush, and it did not work very well. So uh, the general history of tax holidays is they uh, are just that. They're a holiday uh, without the beneficial effects that are hoped for. Thank you very much. Our next speaker for the political group EVP, European People's Party, is Professor Darius Rosati. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Stiglitz, thanks for being with us uh, today. I have a question on, uh, uh, on what we could do on our side here in Europe in order, to, in order to reduce incentives for EU companies to go to tax havens and set up shell companies, uh, trusts, foundations, and uh, what have you. Uh, there are different reasons for them, but what we could do in terms of improving our tax systems and our regulations in order to reduce those incentives uh, and, in other words, to reduce the pull uh, uh, factor uh, in these practices. And uh, my second question is on what could the international community possibly do uh, to put pressure on non-cooperative non jurisdictions in order to uh, somehow uh, enforce them to comply with international tax taxation standards without actually raising doubts that these, this pressure would somehow violate their sovereign rights as of independent states. Thank you, Professor Stieglitz. Peter. Well, uh, uh, sovereignty is always supposed to uh, concern about response. Nos, hát a szuverenitás az mindig, a szuverenitás mindig úgy merül fel, hogy felelős szuverenitásról van itt szó. 
tehát egy ország nem tehet meg olyan lépéseket, amely egy másik országot sért, egy másik ország szuverenitását sérti. Ezért mondják azt, hogy a globális felmelegetés, felmelegedés az bizonyos országoknak olyan lépéseiből származik, amely más országok szuverenitását sérti. A titoktartás, a titoktartási paradicsomok működése más országok szuverenitását sérti, tehát ez azt jelenti, hogy elfogadhatatlan olyan lépések meghozatala, amelyek más országokat veszélyeztetnek, tehát ez a felelős globális állampolgárság vagy meglétetett engem, ez nem aggaszt, tehát nem aggaszt az, hogy egy országnak azt mondjuk, hogy bizonyos dolgokat nem hajthat végre, nem építhet atomrakétákat, vagy dolgozhat ki atomfegyvert, és így, és így tovább, tehát vannak olyan dolgok, amiket nem tehet meg egyik ország sem, és ez is nyugodtan közéjük tartozhat. Rengeteg minden tehetünk annak érdekében, hogy nyomást gyakoroljunk a nem együttműködő államokra. Én ezek közül egyet említek, lehet, hogy ön azt mondja, hogy ez egy elég szélsőséges intézkedés, de szerintem érdemes meghozni. Azt mondjuk, hogy amennyiben nem működnek együtt a globális normákkal, akkor nem kell, hogy nekünk sem, hogy megadjuk a társaságainknak a jogot, hogy az önök bankjait használják közvetítőként. Önöknek van egy fertőző betegsége, fogalmazzunk így, a titoktartás, és mi nem akarjuk, hogy ez a betegség terjedjen, tehát a saját bankjaink és saját vállalataink nem fognak önökkel együttműködni, mi ezt megtiltjuk nekik. Ez a jogunkban áll, és ha betartják a nemzetközi normákat, akkor lehet ezt megváltoztatni. Itt van egy alap dolog, amit ki kellett volna hangsúlyoznom. Fel kell tegyük magunknak a kérdést, hogy vajon ezek az offshore bank központok mivel, mit hoznak a, a globális közösség számára? Mivel járulnak hozzá a globális közösség életéhez? Az egyik elnök jelölt négy évvel ezelőtt nyíltan elmondta, hogy a Kajmán szigeteken tartja a pénzét. És nagyon sok amerikai feltette a kérdést, hogy New York nem jó bank központ? Mit tudnak a Kajmán szigeteken a vagyonkezelésről, amit mi nem tudunk New Yorkban? És hogyha mi ezt nem tudjuk, a mi tudásunk hiányos, akkor nem kellene elmennünk a Kalmián szigetekre, és ott megtanulni ezt tőlük? A válasz az volt, hogy nem arról van szó, hogy a napsütés jót tesz a pénznek, és szaporodik tőle, hanem arról van szó, hogy nincs világosság, a sötétben jobban gyarapszanak a pénzek. Tehát amit nem szabad megengedni, nekem ez kérdéses mindig a az adóarbitrás. Sergio Cofferati következik a szociál... Grazie, Presidente. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I was saying that, as you probably know, the European Union is working to try and define a list of non-cooperative jurisdictions on uh, fiscal issues. I just wanted to stress the importance of uh, this uh, list, and you've mentioned it yourself. You've also, I've also seen it in your uh, written answers uh, that you deal with so-called tax preference and uh, tax-free zones. So I was wondering uh, if you would agree that uh, lacking corporation tax or tax that, taxes that are low or close to zero It uh, has to be one of the key, uh, key criteria for deciding on uh, uh, what is a non-cooperative jurisdiction. I mean, uh, I was wondering what kind of measures that you would uh, consider for uh, defense. Yeah. So, 
Uh, yeah, I think a blacklist can, uh, is important. It's exactly the same point I just uh, made before. But I want let me emphasize uh, the role of uh, white tax preferences uh, and uh, particularly uh, uh, um, uh, 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 these tax-free zones that, that some countries have are uh, particularly pernicious uh, because they – provide a vehicle for money laundering. Uh, that is to say, uh, you, when you engage in uh, activities, you pretend to, to be doing something, uh, you're producing some cloth or something else, and you may do a little bit of that, but the real activity is money laundering. And the big advantage of using the tax free zones is that the profits you make are not taxed. So you, that's why, that's why you know, there, there are a whole standard set of techniques for money laundering. Gambling is one, but tax-free zones are another uh, standard technique for money laundering. So when you see activities in money laundering uh, in, in tax-free zones, you want to look at them very, very carefully. There may be some legitimate activities, but there may be some real money laundering. And that's where I say that the standards of those operating in those zones should be very high. It should not be just a right for anybody to operate there. If somebody is operating in those zones who has uh, been engaged in any one of uh, uh, kinds of questionable activities, uh, they should uh, not be allowed, and if the government allows them, that's a condition for being on the blacklist. Uh, so just like you can't get a bank license if you are a questionable character. There, there is uh, standards that we've established for in any, every country for open, getting a bank license. We don't want the people who are, have a, a, a bad record to be opening up banks because all kinds of activities will, will be undertaken through that bank license. And those same standards should be applied for those operating in a tax-free zone. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Bernd Lucke from the ECR. Yeah, Professor Stieglitz, um, if I understand you well, then what you recommend us to do is increasing transparency. And that is exactly what we work on here. We try to change our legal settings such that transparency is improved on. Now, you are an economist, and I would like to ask you about two different things, uh, namely about substitution and about incentives and disincentives. The way the whole system works, as I understand it, is that there is a whole chain of people involved in these type of activities. There's the beneficial owner, there are people who have power of attorney, there are financial advisors in banks and financial institutions, there are people working for Mossa Fonseca and at least three other law firms in Panama and elsewhere on the world, um, and, and then there are the people who actually run the, um, the uh, offshore uh, companies. Um, my question is, if we increase transparency and break this line of people at some point, what do you think about substitution policy, uh, substitution possibilities for the beneficial owners? Which ways would they have to find new mechanisms to hide their tax liabilities by, I don't know, substituting EU countries for countries somewhere else uh, in the world? And the second question then is, what do you think about um, either decreasing incentives to um, um, do tax avoidance and tax evasion or increase incentives for people to make this known to our law enforcement? So increase incentives to whistleblowers. Like, for instance, whoever brings something to the attention to, of our law enforcement uh, officers would be allowed to walk away with a sizable chunk of, of the wealth in question. So these type of questions, have you any suggestions we could follow up on? Thanks. Vielen Dank. Bitte schön. Thank you. You have the floor. So, uh, I think you're absolutely right that there, there is a huge supply chain, uh, in a sense, of the production 
of these uh, kinds of secrecy and, and, and uh, uh, the difficulties of dealing with it is sufficiently great that we have to attack it at every point. You know, we, we try to attack it basically at the banking system and we made progress there, but we found out that that was not enough. So we now are trying to attack it at the law firm, at the level of the, uh, 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 at various other beneficial ownership, the revelation of beneficial ownership. And I'm hopeful if we attack it on enough places, because it's difficult, uh, that we will get enough transparency that we will effectively shut it down. Now, your question of where will it show up, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, the forces for secrecy are strong enough that they will find some other uh, venue. Uh, that's where I've emphasized this has to be a global attack, one has to be persistent. It's not obvious to me that if we really attack it globally in the way that I've described, that it will actually be able to, to uh, raise its head. We, we may, you know, I, I don't want to say we're going to ever get perfect transparency, but I think the most, uh, the, the, the worst aspects that have been exposed by the Panama Papers, I think those could be shut down. Uh, at least I'm optimistic. And if we don't, uh, if we have the kind of investigation that this committee and other committees, we will expose the new ways that it takes, you know, the new forms that it will take. I think it's going to be very difficult for it to be secret about how it's doing the secrecy. Uh, it will try, but I, so I think uh, we, we will, it, something we'll have to keep at, but I think we will, this is a, 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 a war that we can win. Um, on the uh, second point is, I agree very much is we have to have uh, incentives uh, for whistleblowers. I think that helps. One of the things that concerns me, and we talked a little bit in the report about, is in some countries, it's just the opposite. A individual who whistleblows can go to prison. And a country that has a legal framework like that should be on the blacklist. That is to say, there are some of the things that would get you on the blacklist are legal frameworks that actually make transparency more difficult. So th that, those are things that I think that we, you know, the, the, neg the disincentives I think we can deal with, uh, at least some of the more transparent disincentives, like uh, these laws penalizing whistleblowers, uh, uh, we, we should make sure that countries don't have them. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Uh, als nächste Next, Mrs. Maite Ruiz for the ALDE Group. Gracias, Presidente. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to thank you, Professor Stieglitz. I think our European Parliament has a historic opportunity to face up to these challenges and problems, and we really have to get down to dealing with them. But there are a number of serious problems. If we want to be efficient when it comes to tax evasion, avoidance and money laundering, we need to have clear uh, criteria to how to deal with this. We need a list of tax havens. I know that you're talking about this. The European Commission did submit a proposal for creating a European list, and one of the indicators uh, was that there would be a lack of uh, corporate taxation, zero corporate tax. The member states of the European Union have rejected this requirement. Do you feel that the proposal could be effective if the member states do away with that particular criterion for the list? And in your view, um, what do you think of the other criteria? What are essential criteria for having a list of uh, tax havens that perhaps you can give us one or two clues uh, going beyond what you've already mentioned? Then we know that Luxembourg and Germany are right uh, quite high up the financial security in index. Uh, I, those countries that show the best uh, conditions for uh, evading, uh, avoiding tax and evading tax. And have you taken a look at these? In Spain, we use the version uh, of uh, Alibaba and the 40 thieves uh, rather than any other term to refer to uh, tax havens, secrecy havens or whatever. Thank you. Stieglitz, please. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I... As I uh, said before, I, th I think uh, there are multiple issues here. Um, I think a zero corporate 
uh, tax uh, should be criticized on the issue of tax competition. And the other report that uh, was released uh, 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 by the uh, International Commission uh, for the Reform of International Co uh, Corporate Taxation that Jose Antonio uh, is uh, chairman of, uh, it focused on tax competition. And uh, uh, zero is what we will get if we allow tax competition. Uh, and the dangers of tax competition are that obviously if zero is the corporate tax rate, it means that the burden of taxation has to be borne elsewhere. Uh, others are going to have to bear the tax, and, and that's both inequitable, inefficient, uh, and uh, uh, the, the issue of the role of zero taxation in uh, secrecy and money laundering, I just described a, a few minutes ago, that it does play an important role, uh, uh, but not all the countries that have low tax rates are actually engaged in those kinds of nefarious activities. They are uh, just on the, uh, you know, tax competition. But when the tax competition gets down to zero, you have to ask uh, what is going on, because uh, almost by definition, you don't raise a lot of revenue when you have a zero tax rate. Uh, now, in some cases, it may be about jobs, uh, but in many of these cases, like uh, in the case of Apple in uh, Ireland, uh, there were very few jobs created in Ireland uh, in response to the zero tax rate. So uh, one one has to raise the question: what was going what was going on? Uh, one of the things I think that Europe ought to do about this within Europe is to make. Uh, uh, all these uh, agreements, tax rulings, public. Uh, why should Apple get different tax treatment from General Electric or Google or anybody else? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it was only because of what happened, it was only because of the U.S. Congress that Europe discovered that Apple was getting these special tax agreement. Secrecy, one of the problems of secrecy is that things are secret. And uh, if they're secret, you don't know about them. And it was only because, of, say, of the U.S. Congress that you found out about what was going on in Ireland. And that should not be tolerable. Uh, it should be, all these agreements should be public, <coughs> public, and so that you can assess uh, what is going on. And so you can see if there is a special deal for um, uh, Apple or some other com company. Uh, the interesting thing is clearly if it had all been public, every other company would have asked for a zero tax deal. If every other company had asked for a zero tax deal, then Europe's tax revenue all over would have been zero from American companies. And I think Europe would have found that intolerable and there would have been action on the European front. So uh, this is an example where, where secrecy had very profound political consequences. And uh, I think it's a very great disappointment that one of your countries would take advantage of the other countries uh, within uh, Europe. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Fabio Di Masi from the GUA Group. Welcome, Mr. Siglitz. Uh, you just spoke about Ireland, and Ireland reported this 26% uh, uh, growth rate recently due to tax inversions. The problem is just that no average Irish citizen has seen it trickling down. So could you maybe expand a little bit on what you believe could be the contribution of uh, tax justice to overcoming uh, Europe's economic problems in terms of a lack of investment and uh, austerity? Can it play a positive role for the economic well-being of our citizens. Secondly, uh, we were talking about the blacklist. When we were in Washington with the previous committee, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice told us 
well, there's nothing we can do about Delaware or so on because uh, we can only deal here with the tax rate but not with the secrecy laws, the company laws, and so on. Do you think it would help to convince Mr. Trump to do something about it if we put Delaware and so on on uh, the tax haven uh, blacklist, and would you recommend to do so? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, to answer your second question, yes, I think it would help a great deal. Uh, if you impose sanctions against uh, uh, Delaware and, and whatever other uh, uh, states in the United States are noncompliant. Uh, if it turns out after your investigation they are noncompliant. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that uh, you could say, you know, we are only willing to deal with, with uh, jurisdictions that uh, obey certain standards. And these jurisdictions don't obey those standards. And I'm sorry, uh, uh, European companies cannot deal with banks registered in, say, uh, one of the states in the United States that doesn't meet uh, those, those standards. I think that would certainly draw attention to the issue and uh, might induce them to change their behavior. I think what you heard from some people in the U.S. Treasury was probably an excuse because they have now acted on some of the issues that they said they couldn't act on before. And uh, so, for instance, um, and part of this is, is uh, in response to uh, public outrage in the United States. Uh, it was discovered that a very large, uh, very, very large fractions of uh, purchases of apartments in New York City above a million dollars uh, were uh, by uh, LLCs where we didn't know who the owners were. So it was very clear that uh, there was at least uh, the prospect of money laundering going on massively in real estate in the United States, in New York City. And uh, the Department of, uh, uh, and the U.S. government did respond to that by uh, saying that there has to be a disclosure of beneficial ownership of real estate in uh, first in New York City and, and Washington, D.C., and I think they are now extending that. So uh, the U.S. government does have a wide set of tools that it could undertake if it wanted to. And so uh, uh, the threat of sanctions might induce it to take stronger actions. Uh, and uh, that, uh, as I say, would be uh, very helpful. Uh, the broader issue that you raised, first of all, you know, uh, when you say Ireland grew at 26 percent, I think everybody knows that's not real. Uh, countries don't grow at 26 percent. Uh, and that is only testimony to the phoniness uh, of what was going on. What grew was 26 percent in the reported income, uh, reported GDP, but it's not as if the citizens in Ireland suddenly got 26 percent richer. Uh, I'm sure if you did a survey of the average person and said, is your income gone up by uh, a quarter over the last year, you will be hard-pressed to find anybody who says their income has gone up by 26 percent over the past year. Um, and uh, that just shows the extent of uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, evas evasion kind of activities that are going on where what's reported has nothing to do with what actually the economic activity that actually uh, goes on. But the general point that you raised is that when there is not real tax revenue because of all these uh, monkey business, uh, it imposes an enormous cost because you can't do the investments in infrastructure, education, technology that are necessary for real growth, not for the phony growth that Ireland uh, recorded, but for the real growth that increases the living standards of individuals. And so if you don't have the tax revenues, you can't make those investments in the future. And so that's why what's at issue here, in part, is really the future prospects of Europe as a whole and the world as a whole. Thank you very much, Professor Stieglitz. The next speaker on my list is for the Greens, Pascal Durand.
Merci, ah. euh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz. You are a renowned economist and uh, a very well-known consultant, but you were also an eminent member of the Clinton administration. And, uh, well, I would have been wonderful if that had con continued for another four years, but that voters decided differently. But that means that what you tell us is all the more valuable, because you've been on the decision-making side. I'd like to ask you a question more related to this personal side. First of all, you said quite clearly that sanctions are needed, and those who do not respect the rules need to have sanctions imposed on them. And I'd like to have your opinion, and I speak as a lawyer, on the question of soft law and self-regulation, because the law firms and auditors already have rules. So what kind of uh, force of rules would you like to implement? What type of uh, um, rule would you like to impose? Because we do have these standards already. Secondly, you have been at the heart of decision making. In your opinion, what are the major obstacles, which means that uh, tax evasion, which already existed, uh, tax avoidance, which already existed years ago, what are the obstacles which m mean that decision makers cannot implement public policies which would put an end to these practices? Professor Stieglitz. Yeah. yeah, I think in many of the areas, uh, uh, soft law uh, is an important, can be an important instrument, uh, and I've advocated, for instance, uh, a, a soft law, law approach to sovereign debt restructuring because it's going to be very difficult internationally to get a, a hard law uh, framework. Um, this is an area where um, there already has been a lot of soft law, you might say a lot of pressure, and it's been resilient uh, in a negative sense. It's proven its ability to survive no matter what uh, people have talked about, the importance of openness, transparency, uh, the, the uh, secrecy havens are basically immune from the pressure, the normal pressure of soft law. And that's why one has to ratchet up the pressure. Now, you're absolutely right that in terms uh, of much of what we're talking about, uh, there are already standards, uh, laws, that what the uh, law firms are engaged in, uh, they could already be sanctioned. We don't really need to do anything new. We just have to enforce the standards that we already have. Uh, for instance, uh, the complicity in child prostitution that was revealed in the Panama Papers. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, being part, uh, aiding and abetting that kind of thing is illegal, and a law firm should be sanctioned for engaging in that kind of activity. So in, at some level, all the, what we're saying is we ought to be enforcing the standards we already have. But uh, we obviously aren't enforcing them now. And uh, what, we are, what I'm really saying here is we need to relook at these secrecy havens with uh, a, an understanding that we've been too soft, on the so even on the hard law. Uh, approach to these uh, law firms, uh, and we've certainly been too soft on the soft law approach. And therefore, we really do need to have a stronger enforcement and probably uh, higher standards because they will always try to uh, blur the edges and, and and, and by raising the standards, we'll be, make it clear that they're nowhere near the edge, uh, that they've w stepped well beyond uh, what ought to be a clear line uh, in, uh, in their behavior. Now, the question you asked about what are the obstacles um, uh, the, uh, to dealing with uh, some of these problems, um, uh, there are two that I would identify. Uh, w one is uh, inertia, and the other are 
pressure groups. Let me give you uh, an, an example uh, of both, of each. Um, when I was uh, in the Clinton administration, I raised the issue of our transfer price system as a system of international taxation for multinationals that could not work. And uh, the response of people in the U.S. Treasury was uh, we had worked very hard to create the system of transfer price system in the 1920s, and we don't want to revisit it. It's only 70 years later, and, you know, we're still exhausted from, from that discussion in the 1920s. Well, uh, that was what I would call inertia. They just didn't want, you know, they had other things to do with their lives, and this was, they, they didn't think it was important. I thought it was very important, and, uh, but I couldn't get them uh, to move uh, on the issue. Now we realize how serious the problem is. You know, 25 years later, the problem has grown worse. A system that could not work has not worked. <laughs> and uh, so attention is now focused on it. And hopefully uh, with uh, uh, this international commission that uh, Jose Antonio has headed, that w the, the, the spotlight will be uh, focused on it more strongly. So uh, one is inertia. The, the second is obviously pressure groups. On most of these areas, there's somebody who's benefiting from the current arrangement. And those who benefit don't want to lose those benefits. I mean, it's, I don't, it's as simple as that. They, they, they just, so, um, you know, uh, just to give you another example, um, uh, on a very different, oh, okay, uh, uh, in another very, very different area, uh, uh, I tried to get, introduce a green GDP measure to reflect environmental degradation and resource depletion. And uh, I knew I had gotten onto something important when the coal industry, uh, the coal lobby in the U.S. Congress said, if I continue to talk about this, they would take away all our funding. So uh, it was clear that I had hit a raw nerve. Uh, and uh, obviously nothing happened. Uh, uh, because of uh, they were gaining, they they didn't want attention focused on on uh, the environmental degradation that was resulting from coal. There are a lot of people who are making a lot of money out of tax avoidance under the current arrangement, which is precisely why we have to do something about it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have I look to the watch uh, only seven minutes, uh, but a lot of speakers. Uh, a little bit shorter in the question and in the answer, please. <laughs> the next speaker would be Ray Finch from the EFTD. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Please. Chairman. Professor Stiglitz, in your report, Overcoming the Shadow Economy, as well as in the questionnaire which you kindly filled out for the purposes of this hearing, you say the secrecy havens should be cut off from the global financial and economic system, and you list three bullet points how this is to be done. Your last bullet point says, we can declare it illegal for any bank to have any correspondence relationship or to interact in any way with any financial institution in a non-cooperative ju jurisdiction. Could you clarify what, it mean, what you mean by this? You seem to be implying a total isolation of any such jurisdiction from the rest of the world. Do you think it moral that we let people in these countries starve because their nation's financial system does not comply. Uh, I believe nations seeking to run their own economies is not a reason to punish ordinary people. And my second question, quickly, sir, is you called President-elect Trump a tax evader. Would you also care to comment on Mrs. Clinton's tax affairs and her financial relationship with multinational companies and Middle Eastern dictatorships who helped to fund their political career and campaign? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, the, the issue of uh, countries that make money by uh, undermining 
the global economic system uh, seems to me uh, uh, an issue that I addressed earlier uh, in response to uh, the question uh, from Mr. Rosati about uh, sovereignty. Uh, there's a notion of so uh, responsible sovereignty, and the sovereigns uh, impose costs on others. Uh, they, their country has to pay the cost of that. And the citizens of those countries need to respond and say, uh, we, we, to their government, you cannot uh, get away with imposing costs on others. You can't get away with global warming. You can't get away with pollution of other kinds. And you can't get away with polluting the global economy by your secrecy havings, uh, contributing to uh, whether it's corruption, childhood, child prostitution, uh, any of these activities, uh, you, those are costs that you are imposing on the rest of our society, and that's unacceptable. Now, unfortunately, when you impose a cost on a country, there will be some innocent victims. Uh, that's an inevitable consequence of any form of sanctions. Uh, and uh, we've imposed sanctions against Russia as it's violated international law in taking over uh, uh, eastern Ukraine. And I think that's the right action to take. Thank you very much. Next speaker would be uh, Chil Le Breton, ENF. Ah, okay. Monsieur Stiglitz, uh, merci. Mr. Stiglitz, uh, Thank you very much for attending our uh, uh, Committee of Inquiry. The pa Panama Papers showed th up three different types of transactions. First of all, tax ev evasion. Secondly, money laundering from organized crime. And third, covering up corruption and uh, conflicts of interest by public officials or politicians. Well, let's look at that third case. Do you think that the EU and the US have got the necessary means to struggle effectively against corruption? You've said that they just don't do it. Well, I've got four questions as a result. First of all, do you think that the election of Donald Trump is going to in make the US intensify their efforts at transparency? Two, do you think that the EU has a genuine will to struggle against corruption and tax evasion? Because you know that the, Brussian, uh, the Brussels Commission is, preside, uh, uh, commission is presided over the former president of a tax haven, namely Luxembourg. Thirdly, do you think that uh, uh, the euro has done anything to discourage uh, tax evasion more than na individual national currencies? And fourthly, do you think a return to a reasonable kind of protectionism could mean uh, a way to protect ourselves? Thank you. Uh, la deuxième question est déjà, uh, claire. Thank you very much. I think the second question has already been answered. Yeah, uh, I, I think I, I'm glad you brought out the, uh, uh, the third aspect, that, that secrecy has also served uh, to high conflicts of interest and corruption uh, in both uh, developing countries and uh, advanced uh, economies. And I, I, it's been a major uh, source of problems. Uh, one of my original interests in this was when I was chief economist uh, of the World Bank, uh, and there was massive corruption in the case of uh, one of the countries. And the money, it was known, was hidden in uh, London. But the country couldn't get at that money. Uh, and that's uh, the role of, of London uh, as a secrecy uh, haven. Um, I'm very worried that uh, with the election of President uh, Trump uh, that the resolve to uh, deal with uh, these issues uh, will uh, uh, become weaker. Um, there's a lot of discussion of well, whether uh, the term conflict of interest is even in his vocabulary. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, we haven't set up the right uh, framework for dealing with conflicts of interest. Uh, but uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, 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 the fact that uh, uh, the EU is headed by uh, uh, the architect 
of the uh, 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 of the tax avoidance schemes, which actually impose costs on other countries, uh, is obviously problematic. And and I think uh, the good news is that people are so aware of it; it has increased attention and focus on this issue. And uh, the fact that people are asking this question is is suggestive that people are are, are very you know, it is very much uh, in the public uh, awareness. Um, the, uh, there are a whole set of things I haven't been able to talk about that help facilitate uh, corruption, uh, lack of transparency. One of them is bearer shares. Uh, bearer shares are a way of non-transparency. Uh, the 500 euro note is another way of lack of transparency because it reduces the cost of uh, of not of of carrying money around. Um, I, I have to. I know time is running out, but I have to tell a little story, which was uh, when uh, I again when I was in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, I wanted uh, to get rid of um, uh, bearer U.S. bonds because those bare U.S. bonds were being used, I thought, for corruption and for similar purposes. And the response of the U.S. Treasury was, if we got rid of it, the interest rate would go up. Of course, you have to understand what they meant. They realized that the demand for U.S. Treasury bills by those who were uh, wanted non-transparency and were avoiding taxes uh, was sufficiently great that it affected the price. But you were losing on tax revenues what you were uh, gaining on the other side. But you shouldn't be complicitous in this, in this corruption. And yet the U.S. Treasury focusing narrowly on the issue of I want to minimize the interest rate was willing to be complicitous in, tax, in, in corruption and tax evasion. It was, to me, it was a kind of mindset I could, I could not uh, understand. Um, I don't think protectionism is the answer. I don't think that will, will help. Uh, uh, we are already in a sufficiently integrated world with people moving around that, uh, that protectionism is not the answer. But the correct answer is when we have trade agreements, making sure the trade agreements include provisions that have transparency and help us fight this war. Uh, and that should be an integral part of any trade agreement. Thank you very much. We have now, uh, for your answer, we have now uh, two additional questions from the political, the two biggest political group, Ludek Niedermeyer and uh, uh, Emmanuel Morel. Ludek. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, uh, Professor Stiglitz, for coming here. Uh, my first question relates to your answers to questions from committee, and it seems to me that when you are describing web or network uh, that was employed uh, in Panama, not only there, it seems to me that legal firms seem to be the weakest spots because the banks and um, accountants, advisors are uh, subject to certain regulation, but the law firms are not. So I wonder if this uh, observation is correct. And the second question is that uh, this committee and work in the parliament uh, also focuses on uh, tax avoidance in addition to tax evasion. I wonder to which extent you as being premier economist, you believe that uh, inconsistent and too complicated system of the tax codes uh, is playing very important role in promoting tax avoidance and to which extent government should dedicate more energy in simplifying and clarifying the tax codes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Stieglitz, please. Uh, yes, I, I, I think one of the two weakest uh, links is the law, today, are, are the law firms, uh, but also uh, the uh, uh, nexus of uh, corporations, tr trusts, foundations with their secrecy and uh, what we have to do is get the beneficial ownership. Uh, those, I think, are, are at least two of the main uh, weaknesses in the current uh, uh, 
uh, framework of, of openness. Uh, I agree, tax avoidance uh, is a major problem, and uh, simplification uh, uh, should be uh, one of the approaches to it. Uh, but uh, one always has to balance out. Uh, you can get a simplified tax code. A lot of people uh, have argued, you know, if you have a zero tax rate, you will get no tax avoidance at a zero tax rate. Uh, but that doesn't solve your problem of wanting to generate tax revenue. So you have to balance out uh, that uh, corporations have an enormous amount of ingenuity. Uh, you think you have a simple tax system. And I can guarantee they will find some way of adding complexity to it that uh, you haven't thought of. Uh, there's a whole industry of tax lawyers out there. And that you have to under, you know, a lot of the complexity that is there <laughs> is there defensively as people have creatively uh, tried to think of ways of not paying taxes. So uh, there may be ways of, of uh, uh, trying to, to get greater simplification by restarting, it, realizing that the way the system has gone is uh, you've had a tax law, then somebody circumvents it, and then you say, okay, we'll have to stop that. And then they circumvent the circumvention, and you say you have to stop that. And then they circumvent the circumvention it may be at some point you want to go back to ground zero and say, okay, what's going on here? And let's rewrite the rules and uh, start over the process. Thank you very much. The, the last speaker on my list is Emmanuel Morel. Uh, we, are, we have now 12.36, and uh, it would not be possible to start the catch the eye system. Please. Merci. Yes, thank you, Emma, very much. Very briefly, Mr. Stiglitz, you've just referred to trade agreements, and we have realized when uh, we've uh, taken a look at the situation in Panama and other, uh, else, re other regions that um, tax fraud money laundering is not necessarily flowing through um, tax havens, but some of the financial transactions. So what about some kind of fiscal conditionality uh, in ta trade agreements, i.e., if you do not respect uh, a central beneficiary's uh, register, beneficial ownership register or country-by-country by country by country by country reporting in your own country, then you will not be able to enjoy the benefits of the trade agree agreement. So what do you think of that kind of solution? Secondly, I've read your, um, your text, your book on the euro as well. But regardless of the kind of pressure that's uh, placed on the euro when it comes to the non-economic um, uh, uh, financial situation that we need to do something else to perhaps uh, prevent uh, tax avoidance, uh, uh, minimum uh, tax rate, uh, for example, in the Eurozone. Do you think that would be a good idea to be able to uh, contain the uh, phenomenon of tax avoidance? Well, we can't d discuss the situation of the Euro today. I'm sorry. I, I do apologize. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those uh, suggestions that uh, the condition in, in, ta in trade agreements, uh, we uh, could put in a condition that uh, to get these trade benefits, you have to satisfy these minimal conditions of, of uh, transparency, uh, beneficial ownership. I think that would be a good idea, uh, and that would uh, advance the, the principle of, of transparency uh, enormously. Um, I also think, in fact, it's, it's uh, related to uh, uh, this report for ways to uh, tackle international tax competition. Uh, the first recommendation of uh, our commission was put a floor under tax competition, and uh, the best way to do that is through an agreed minimum tax uh, rate. Uh, corporate tax rate, uh, and we describe how that could be implemented. If, uh, from a global point of view, if just the U.S. and the EU, or even one of those, just the United States or the EU, agreed on a minimum corporate tax rate, uh, that would uh, at least 
set a floor and uh, eliminate the extremes of tax competition and the extremes of, of tax avoidance that we are seeing today. Thank you very much, Professor Stieglitz. Uh, I think uh, the evidence and the experience you shared with us today are very stimulating our own work in this inquiry committee. Thank you very much. It was a very fruitful and very good discussion. I, ich möchte den Dolmetschern danken. I would also like to thank the interpreters for giving us an extra 10 minutes. The meeting is adjourned. Okay. Yeah. I promised your assistant to... Uh...